Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, geeks the world over, welcome to Tweaks for Geeks. My name is Eric. My name is Dan. My name is Stephen. My name is Aziza. And leading us today is America's pen maker, Mr. Brian Gray. Mr. Gray, how are you today? Very good. I gotta say, I feel so underdressed after that intro you just put up. <laughs> that was fantastic. I, I, I had not seen that before. Is that new, just for Tweaks for Geeks? It's not just for Tricks for Geeks. It it is new. Uh, it was made by. Let's see. It was produced, uh, filmed, directed, and post production was done by Juan Carlos Orozco, who three of us in this room knew, uh, mm -hmm. a fellow found pen geek, um, and I just threw that up there because I thought it was pretty exciting, and That's I wanted really to start cool. the show with some excitement. That's uh, you cool. Know, more than we generally provide. Um, we just did FPTV this morning. We're all sick of looking at each other. So why don't I just throw the show to Mr. Brian Gray. We're here to talk about nib tuning and smoothing, and uh, you are our leader today, Mr. Gray. Please take Well, thanks, off. Eric. First of all, if there's any audio issues, let me know. I'm not using my normal microphone because I just don't want that in front of my mouth right now. Um, but uh, first of all, thanks for having me on. This is an idea that I've had for a while uh, that I really want to... I always encourage my clients and fountain pen people in general to, to tinker with your pens. You know, learn how to make your nibs better, learn how to do some repairs, learn how to do some minor adjustments or even major adjustments as you get better and better. But the real issue that I've had, I've honestly had plans to do something like this for probably two or three years now. But the issue that I've always had is that I don't think that a written article can truly convey what I want to. I'm not sure that a filmed uh, presentation is really what I also wanted. The main reason is because, you know, if you give this information in the wrong way or if you don't convey it, or convey it correctly, you know, you could end up causing more harm to the, the pen community than you could help because if you're really not explaining these techniques properly, you can run into problems, you know, because I misunderstood this article and now my nib is all messed up. So that's why I think this Google Hangout is best because we have like a round table setting, we have people interacting with each other, and the whole format of this is going to be, I'll give a presentation, I'll show how I approach nib tuning, um, and then we're gonna bring in some people that will bring their problematic friends, and we're going to fix them together. We're gonna smooth your nib together. We're gonna align your tines together. That's really the whole idea, okay? So before I get too far into this, you'll notice that I am on two cameras. I've got camera two right here, and I've got camera one right here. So I'm going to be demonstrating my pen stuff down here, and then I'll be speaking to you live up here. So if that makes, that, what, you know, when Eric and I sat down thinking about the best way to do it, one of the limitations was how do we actually see what you're doing on a Google Hangout? So I've got a nice new webcam. I think it's pretty good resolution. It's going to show what we need to do, okay? So, uh, the other thing, I do want to put out, uh, well, probably more than one disclaimer. Number one, I'm not claiming to be an authority on this. I know that there's a couple people here on this chat right now that also do great nib work. So, I'm not going to say that I'm the authority, this is the right way. I'm just showing you what my methods are, what I've learned over the years, what other people have taught me, and what I've also discovered on my own. So, anybody here that wants to interject, please, uh, my attitude about this is let's all learn together, and I'm not the one that's laying down the authority, and this is the right way to do it, okay? Just this is what I know works best for me, and I'm sure that this will help lots of fountain pen people as we move along with this, okay? So, okay, we'll kind of get right into it. Oh, well, the second, the second disclaimer, I'll say this quickly, but I don't think I need to. All of this is at your own risk. Please don't take these techniques that, that we're showing you right now 
and you do something and you mess up your nib and then you email Brian or the FP geeks and hey it's all your fault you know usual disclaimers do all this at your own risk that being said use your cheap pens use your cheap steel nibbed uh, Lamy Safari whatever Pilot Varsity or even these pens that we got from Richard Bender here I'm going to camera two even these pens we got from Richard Bender um, that, you know, they're basically throwaway pens, cartridge converter. They're perfect for learning tie alignment. You know, you're not going to be heartbroken if you break this pen, okay? So that's, that's uh, a good disclaimer that I should get out of the way. Now, um, one other thing, if you did download the notes that we had on the FP Geeks website and the Edison Pen website, good to have them, but I won't necessarily, I'll, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of using it as a script, but don't think that you need that in order to participate right now. I, I wrote that up more or less so that people will have something to refer to in the future. When, you know, uh, you, you won't need to watch the whole hour and a half of this to get the point. You can go back to these bullet points that I've set up here, okay? So getting into this, rule number one that everybody needs to know about smoothing nibs, tine alignment, is that the first and the final diagnosis and the most important diagnosis of how your pen performs is actually writing with it. And I know that might, might sound very basic, it might sound kind of duh, but it happens pretty frequently that someone gets a pen, they look at it through the loop, and they see something that they figure, well, this is definitely a problem. And I've gotten a couple emails like this where something comes in the mail or, you know, I get an email and someone says, Brian, I got a problem with the nib here. Uh, the, the feed channel looks like it's off and this looks like, and I got it. I mean, there's no way. And I go, well, did you write with it? I didn't write with it yet. Why don't you give it a try? And then, you know, so I, you understand my point. The loop and magnification and looking through the loop and diagnosing with the loop is a very, very important tool, but it's not the end all to be all. Uh, it is simply a way to guide you to get your pen to write exactly the way it should, but the final test, the final diagnosis is when you actually write with it. If you write with it and there's nothing wrong, then there's nothing wrong. Ignore what you see in the loop as far as I'm concerned. If you're writing with it and there's no issues, then you have no issues, okay? So that's, that's really what's most important. Uh, the disservice that could be done with a presentation like this is to not stress that point because I could have all these fountain pen people all across the world grabbing their loop and they think that there's problems with half of their pens in, in their pen collection. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but the final test is actually writing with the pen. Okay, so um, today we're going to cover, we're going to keep it fairly basic. The idea of Tweaks for Geeks is to keep this as an ongoing show. In other words, uh, I, I think I mean, we're, we're winging it right now, but I think the future format will follow this format where someone will present a topic and then we'll bring people on that, you know, could use that topic and they need help fixing their pens. That's what the whole idea of this will be. But today we're going to keep it very simple. What we're going to do is talk about tying alignment, smoothing nibs, and flossing. And that's really it. As far as more complex issues, we'll cover that another day. Okay, this is the most important issue though I feel for beginners who have never really done any pen tweaking before to learn first okay um, first of all I do want to say thanks to Richard Bender uh, we did uh, have um, you know we sent people to his website to pick up these smoothing kits which is you know these I'm going to camera two uh, these uh, lapping paper micro mesh now this is actually my stuff so not, not to confuse people this is what came in the Richard Bender kit the brass the micro mesh pen and um, lapping film. So thank you to Richard. If anybody uh, needs these, because obviously if you're going to be doing these techniques, you need these tools. You know, you can go to Richard to, to purchase those. Um, so before I get into the whole presentation, I want to tell a little bit of maybe a personal story as to why I think this is really important to the fountain pen community. A great pen with a bad nib is like a Ferrari with a flat tire. You know, I mean, I don't want to say literally, but you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's so disappointing to have a beautiful pen, and then when you actually put the nib on the paper, it just doesn't write well. It's the most disappointing thing that you could ever experience out of that pen. But then when you actually work this and you figure it out and you get it, then all of a sudden it, it, it's just wonderful. So on a personal note, when I first started with fountain pens a long time ago, I was a wood turner and a woodworker, and I bought these kit pens. And these kit pens came, you know, I bought mostly rollerballs. I made rollerball pens. And then I, um, 
got a couple fountain pen kits as well. And that was my first experience. I think I had a fountain pen when I was like eight years old. I can't remember, like a calligraphy pen. But this is my first real experience with a fountain pen that, that really sticks with me. These kit pens came with these cheap Taiwanese nibs. And uh, Indian, Chinese, Taiwanese, they were just poor generally. Um, and so when I first wrote with my fountain pen, I thought, is this it? This really isn't that cool. I don't know. It's real scratchy. It isn't flowing really well. It's not that exciting for me. And uh, maybe fountain pens aren't that great. I stuck with it. I bought like a Lamy Safari. I bought, uh, I think, a Lamy Vista, some other less expensive pens. And those were a little better. I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. I kind of like this. All right, these nibs are definitely better. Those were German-made nibs. They were better quality. But they still weren't quite, you know, what I would 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 tune to today, what, what I would aspire to today. And then I was on vacation, and, and, I, and I thought, I'm going to pick up some really, really nice fountain pens. And I got a Lamy Studio Palladium, and I got a Pilot VP. Gold nibs. Well, gold nibs, that's got to be like the ultimate writing experience, right? Of, of course. So I spent, I think, like 130 for one and 120 for the other. And I got back home with them. And I'm like, again, is this as good as it gets? This isn't really that great. Well, the Lamy Studio Palladium was squeaking and the VP was misaligned. But here's the thing. I didn't know that. I had no idea that, you know, I mean, literally, if you take a look at a nib with the naked eye, that's a fine, medium, or smaller, or a medium, fine, or smaller, you really can't tell with the naked eye if your alignment is off. You can't tell if it's perfect. And how many people are actually taking magnification to their nibs? Not a lot, and that's why we encourage this. So at that point in time, I was kind of at a crossroads where now everybody knows which route I took. I, I kept with fountain pens to the point of where I loved them so much that I'm manufacturing them and then running a business based on them, of course. But it's quite possible that at that period in time, I could have just said, yeah, you know what? Fountain pens aren't for me. I don't really like it. And I never would have known the difference because I never would have written with a good nib, okay? Or a nib, I shouldn't say a good nib, a nib that was tuned, that was feeling good to me. So the point of all this is that there's got to be scads of people in the fountain pen community that have experienced this, that will experience this, or that are right now experiencing this. And so the whole idea here is to make sure that by learning these little techniques we're going to teach you today, that what's going to happen is, I promise, if you've never done anything with smoothing papers, with tine alignment, with flossing, I guarantee you're going to breathe life into your fountain pen collection. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying that every nib in your collection is bad, but you're going to find these little techniques where your bad nibs, you'll be able, hopefully, to fix. You know, your okay nibs, you're going to get them to sing. Hopefully, all of your nibs will see some kind of improvement. That's really the whole idea behind this, is being able to, as a consumer, take your pens that aren't performing well and get them taken care of without having to go to the nibmeister. Now, of course, there's some topics that are way too complex for this, we won't address, but most of the issues that your pens might have, I think we can give significant improvement to them through this little presentation here, okay? So that's kind of my personal story. Before I go on, does anybody have, um, I mean, anything in the chat room, anything that the FP geeks would like to address before I keep going further? I have one thing. No. Uh, I have one thing. Uh -huh. I, I do have the kit that we we uh, suggested people who want to follow along with you purchase, and I have okay. I have two of the pens that came with the kit. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm going to follow along with you, but the nibs on these are pretty smooth already, so are I they? don't know what I'm gonna, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to have to do. Um, well, the the same. Yeah. The, well, I, I, well, I was going to ask you. The, I, I yeah. will I will leave one as it came out of the box, and I will tweak the other one so that we can actually do something with it. How? And I cannot be the only person watching you that received these pens and finds them to be pretty smooth. They're, yeah. they're pretty good, just right out of the box. How would you want me to tweak this nib so that we actually I can work with you as you're demonstrating? Let's get to that um, in a little bit, and don't uh -huh. let me forget it. Because basically, the technique that I'll show you for moving tines and adjusting tines, we use the same technique, but we'll just we'll put them out of whack instead okay. of putting them back in order. Okay, so we'll just address that then. Okay, so write on a brick. I'm sorry. You can just write on a brick. Yes, that I, should on a brick. I, I, I imagine you have a brick handy. Do you, Doc Brown? Uh, actually, I do. Never mind. Go on. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, besides 
the one lesson I said is most important is to actually write with the pen. That should be your diagnosis. Another important thing that everybody should realize is that 95% of the time, a smoothing issue has very little to do with the nib needing smoothed. It's usually tine alignment, and it's usually issues that you can't really see with the naked eye. So you don't understand why this nib is not writing well. It's very important that you align the tines first, and then you go to smoothing. I'll explain that in a while, but I want everybody to understand, you know, well-made nibs generally don't come out of the factory with, with, without a nice high polish on the, on the tip. They always do, right? I mean, of course, we can get it a little better if we want to, but there's no way that all these nibs coming out of nib manufacturers that have problems are all smoothing issues. It's the fact that if these are the, if these are the tines on your nib, you know, look, look, look at camera one here, if these are the tines on your nib and you've got this going on where one tine is lower than the other, then guess what? That's going to scratch because this corner of the tine is digging into your paper, okay? So what I'm going to teach you first is how to bring those back in alignment, okay? So first, we need to start with a loop. Now, where did my loop go? Here it is. This, I'm going to camera two. This is my preferred loop, and I'll tell you why. Now, the, the exact loop that you get does not matter that much. You know, if it's 10x, 15x, 20x, that's pretty good. I think that 30x is a little bit too powerful for me. But I'll tell you why I really like this loop. It's because it has this shroud right here. And this shroud will give you the precise focal point, okay? If I take this piece of micro mesh and lay it right on the shroud, that's the perfect distance to focus on what you're looking at. So in other words, if I just put my eye up to it, that's already there. Loops that do not have this shroud to give you the focal point, I don't like them. And the reason is because I'll go over to camera one. When I'm looking at a nib, I've got to hover my hand. I've got to hover my uh, loop. And I've got to try my best to bring this in. The reason that I like this shroud is that when I'm tuning a nib, I'm going to camera two. I will put my finger on the side of the nib like this. And then I will bring, I got to bring the camera up a little bit. I will bring my finger right to the shroud. You see how my finger goes right there on the shroud. And then I can pivot to find the exact focal point. Okay. So when I do this, I've got like, you know, the loop kind of anchors against the bridge of my nose. And then my finger an anchors the pen and my finger hinges off the shroud. That's why I love this nib. Like, we just finished up that Morgan project, and in one day, we tuned, I tuned, 90, almost 90 pens, okay? And if I, if I had to juggle this around, and if I had to hover to find the right focal point, that's difficult. That's why I like this loop. I can rest my finger on that shroud, bring it right into focus, and boom, I've got it. And if I'm a little off, it only takes a slight adjustment to do it. That's why I like this loop. Equally as important, is a lighted loop. Back to camera two. I really think that having a lighted loop is pretty important. You may not know the difference or you may not realize the true difference until you actually try a loop without a light and then you go back. Now it, it sounds elementary but there's a lot of loops out there that don't have lights and I think it's critical. If, if this was not lit I would have a lot more trouble seeing what's going on with that nib. So Again, that's my preference. I know that Eric and Steven have a different preference for their loop. This is just my personal loop that I love and why I like it, because I can quickly find my focal point. I okay? think that's, that's extremely important if you're going to do 90 tunings in one day. There I don't go. happen to do that, so I don't yep. really need the focal assistance with that shroud. But the light is absolutely necessary. I spent a long time with a loop without a light. As soon as I got a loop that had a light, it's a world of difference. Steven, do you agree? I absolutely agree. Yeah, it's it's the especially when you go to higher magnifications, the the, it, the 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 image starts to get a little darker, and then it's really really useful to have a light. And even on a ten powered loop, I think it's it's good to have a light. I agree. Yeah. I I, I think no I think no matter what, uh, what whatever magnification is right for you is right for you. Whether or not you want that shroud as a pivot point, it's up to you. But I do think that a light loop is the most important thing to consider when you're getting a loop. I, if you're not lighted, you're just going to not, you're just not going to see as much and you're going to strain your eyes probably as well. So I would definitely lean towards a lighted loop. Okay. Cool.
Okay, so let's get into tie-in alignment. Um, like I said, the first thing that you're going to look for is tie-in alignment. Let's, let's say that you make a common mistake. You don't look at your tines before you go to smooth them. And let's say that they're off, uh, uh, camera one over here. Let's say that your tines are off like this, and you don't know it because you haven't looked under the loop to, to, to figure that out. When you take this to the smoothing paper, a misaligned nib to the smoothing paper, remember, smoothing paper is abrasive, even though it feels very, very, you know, it doesn't feel abrasive. Um, if you take that right to the abrasive without aligning your tines first, then this corner that lays down is going to get rounded over, and then you're going to have a problem. You know, uh, you may be able to get the pen to write a little bit better, but basically you have not balanced the tines before you bring them back in. And if that, if, 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 if you round off this corner and then later the tines come back into alignment, then you can guarantee that this corner is going to be rounded over and you're going to create some problems with flow. Now we won't get too far into that. I'm just stressing the importance that tine alignment has to happen first. You do not smooth the nib until you've actually looked at it to see where it is. Okay? So when we do look at the nib, what are we looking for? For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm not going to get into complex or really wacky tine alignments. Let's just assume that your tines are going to look either like this or like this or right on, or kind of somewhere in between. If you end up looking at your looking at your tines and you've got this uh, like a reverse splay in this direction, or if you've got a really severe splay in this direction, that's not something we'll cover on this broadcast now. We're just going to deal with simple alignment, not not a splay in either direction. So if you look at your nib and you've got this going on really bad or this going on really bad wait for a future installment, we'll deal with that. Let's just assume that we're dealing with these problems, okay? Now, if you have the note and the, the handout, you'll see examples that I put on that. Uh, you, you don't need it right now, because I'm basically showing you with my hands what we have going on right there. Um, so we're going to take this pen, and I'm going to tune it up. Um, I'm looking at it under magnification, and I see that the left time is a little bit high. Okay, now I feel that it's important. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Two questions, actually. Is there a proper way to look at the nib? Uh, um, some people say you hold it like this. Some people say you hold it with the nib up or down at an angle. Is there a proper way to uh, look at your nib tines with a loop? My how, you personal, how are you holding the pen? My personal preference is with the nib up coming right at you as if you're going to stab yourself in the eye. Okay. okay? Now, it's never going to hurt. Usually, I can tell everything that I need to tell by looking at it in this direction, but it's never going to hurt to go up on this angle and take a look at the underside, and it's also never going to hurt to look at it upside down with the nib down. Okay? Now, I don't spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, usually, what I... And again, this is just me. I, again, I'm not the authority. This is my method. Um, I will um, look at it generally nib up as if I'm stabbing my eye, and then I'll also bring it down a little bit to see you know, what the writing surface looks like. But for the purposes of our workshop right now, I think the most important angle will be directly at you, nib up as if you're about to stab your eye. Don't get too involved with this quite yet because that won't really show you this alignment that I'm, that I'm worried about. Okay. Uh, did I say I had two questions? Because I yes. do have two. Thank that you for answering the first fine. one. The second question is, you said that the left tine is uh, too high. Is that what you said? Yes. How do you know that the left tine is too high and instead of the right tine being too low? Well, I, okay. It, 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 it's not going to matter. Oh, I mean, the, the, okay. the, they're relative to each other. I could have said that the right time was low, and basically the, the same thing is true. I'm just, I'm just I'm finding one way. I mean, there's two ways to say the same thing. You know, right. they're, they're, you're, you're saying it's just semantics. It, it isn't that the left you. one is too high. Yeah. It, it could be that the right one is too low. Yeah, you could, you could say the left is too high. You could say the right is too low. You're saying the same thing, basically. Okay. okay? I thought so one the, was in, I thought, the way you said it, I thought the right one was in the correct position, and somehow you knew that. No, the, 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 there is no, like, in other words, like, let's say that this is the butter zone, and then the, the tines need to be in here, and one's out and one's in. That's not really it. As long as the tines come together, and they're still making good contact with the feed, which I'll get to in a second, that's what we're after. So for the purposes of what we're doing right now, there is not necessarily 
uh, one that's up and one that's down, and one is right and one is wrong. We just want to get them together for now, okay? Okay. Uh, then tell me if I'm wrong. If I see that I have one time that is higher and one that is lower, I will always choose to lower the higher time rather that's, than raise the lower time. That's what we will always do first okay. is lower the high time and the reason I'll explain right now as we get into this. So um, so let's say my, what did I say, my left time was high, was that it? Um, yeah, so um, essentially this, I'm going to camera two over here, this time here on this side is a little bit high. And you know what, I might have said left, but I think that my camera is reversed, so I'm getting confused as I look at myself in the monitor. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do is, the first thing that you wanna do is push the high tine down. So I'm, I, I'm gonna use my fingernails, do not use tools, do not use pliers, do not use tweezers, do not use anything except your fingers and your fingernails, all right? I'm just gonna grab this by the wing, and I'm gonna push it down. So you're using the wing as sort of a fulcrum and pushing Correct. down. Okay. Yep. I see if I can. It's not perfectly focused, but basically my fingernail is just coming in right here, and I'm pushing that tine down. And meantime, um, you're, the tip of your index finger is pushing up on the wing or the wing in the feed. No, just just holding it stable. Just okay. holding it stable. Okay. So I push that down, and I'm going to look under magnification. Okay. Now it's closer. But before I go on, I want to explain to you why we push the high time down first, okay? Or at least why that's the first step. When you're moving tines, what you do not want to do, now you, you can raise a time, no problem, but when you do, you've got to be conscious of this. Let's say that, uh, I don't know if I can do this with my hands somehow. Let's say that this is, <laughs> let's say that this is the feed, my fist is the feed, and this is the nib, okay? The nib up, up here on top. If I am lifting the time and it lifts up far enough that there's a gap in between the nib and the feed, that's a problem. That's why I would rather see people push the tines down to start with because what you'll be doing is you'll be ensuring that there's good contact between the feed and the nib, okay? If you do this and you raise the nib up, then guess what? Capillary action will work in the opposite direction and it will, it will pull the nib away from the tip of, of uh, I'm sorry, it'll pull the ink away from the tip of the nib rather than delivering it to the tip. Capillary action is the fundamental principle of fountain pens. When you have a liquid that is in between two surfaces and they're tapered, the liquid will draw itself towards the more narrow surface. That's how a fountain pen works. If you raise up a tine so bad or so far that it actually creates that gap, then the ink will travel backwards instead of forwards. Sounds That's like why a new filling system. <laughs> well, it's what they're all based on that, basically. is all capillary action. That's what a fountain pen is all about. So the first time coming down, take a look. I'm getting very close, but I am going to lift the other time, okay, mostly for a demonstration purpose. So I've already done this, and I've brought this tine down. Now I'm going to bring the other tine up. So what, when I what, what 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 kind of pen is that, Brian? This it's an Edison Beaumont. And is it a steel nib or gold nib? Steel nib. Okay. Yep. So I'm now going to lift a tine up, and when I do this, here's what I feel is very important. Now, if you don't want to get ink on your fingers then this is not for you, all right? You'll definitely get ink on your fingers when you're doing this stuff, especially this step. I'm going to take the feed and the top of the nib and pinch it together. The reason I'm going to do this is that when I lift up on this tine, that will keep the nib firmly against the feed and it will reduce that risk of lifting the, the, the nib off of the feed, reversing the capillary action. Does that make sense to everybody why I do that? I keep that firmly planted against the feed so that all of my pressure is not lifting the whole nib. I'm basically lifting just the tine and keeping the rest of the nib tight against the feed. Make sense? Makes sense. And I assume you lift it a little further than you want it to, to be so that it'll yep. go back to hopefully where you want it to be. Exactly. What, what, what you're trying to do is, I mean, again, if you're doing this at home for the first time, just take baby steps. 
Move, move it a little, then take a look. Move it a little, take a look. See how much force it really takes to get it to move where you want it to move, okay? And then, you know, one, once you've done that, then you go back to the loop. And, you know, when you see that, I need a paper towel. When you see that your tines have gone from this to this, and they're perfectly aligned, then we're good. You've done your tine alignment. That's really it. Bottom line is that if you're going to lower a tine, I do it with the nib up, and I push down. If we're going to raise a tine, I do it with the nib down. I firmly grab the feed and the nib, and then I pull it up, ensuring that I'm not you know, uh, creating a gap in between the two. And don't forget, you can always do this. Take a look and make sure that there's no gap. If there's no gap, you've got no problem, of course, and you're in good shape. So, any question? Basically, that's it on tine alignment. You know, now there's more complex topics. We'll cover it another day. But that, that's basically it when it comes to basic tine alignment. Anything that we should discuss before I move on to smoothing? Well, no, but I will say that one of these pens that I just told you was pretty smooth okay. is not perfectly aligned. Now that I okay. look at the loop, but so how are uh, you going to do it? Basically, just you know. Well, I'm going to push down on the one that I think the one the, the one that is higher. I'm going to push down on. Yep, and, and and if you want to take this these cheapo pens, you know that we're learning with, you can just take this nib and just pull it up and look. Well, I can't show you because you need magnification. Hey, guess what? My right tine is up about half the distance of what it should not be. So I just messed it up, right? Practice with this pen. Take this cheapo from Richard uh, Binder. Um, again, thank you, Richard, and um, and raise up the tine, and then write with it, and feel it, and see how that feels. Wow, that's really not very good. Now, take the tine back, and put it back into alignment to where it feels perfect, and then write with it again. I guarantee, like I said, tine alignment is 95% of smoothing issues. Just making these little incremental changes, you will feel a difference when you write with that pen, okay? So if you want to practice on this pen, then make it out of whack purposely, then bring it back in, and then find, you know, where a good spot is for you personally, or, you know, or, or, or where the nib is going to function best. And experiment some. That's, you know, especially with these cheap pens, play around. If you mess it up, who cares, you know? Okay. Or even, you know, think about, think, I always encourage my clients to go ahead and, and, and tinker with their pens all that they want. Now, of course, my, you know, I, I'm not going to say that my pens are inexpensive, but if, you're in, <laughs> if you have a problem with trying to tinker, I'm always going to help you out anyways. If you've got an Edison pen with a steel nib and you feel confident doing this, then do it. If you have any problem, I promise I have never in my career as a pen maker ever scolded someone because they tried to tweak their nib. I encourage it. I love it. I think that everybody should do their best to learn how to adjust their nibs. It just makes the hobby better. And you'll, you know, if you've never done these before, like I said earlier, and you take these techniques and you learn how to apply these to your pens, you'll breathe life into your collection. Not that there wasn't before, but you know what I mean. You'll, you'll breathe more life into your collection. Cool. So, so the first the... test is to write. And if you think there's a problem, well, if, if you can't feel a problem writing, there's no problem, no matter right. what it looks like under well, the loop. Yeah, but it... I mean, a, a little smoothing will never hurt, of course. So usually I do that no matter what. But if you don't have a problem, there is no problem. Right. Don't imagine problems and don't create problems because you're getting this magnification and all of a sudden you're seeing something that you think is a mess. Uh, I got to send this pen back. Well, you don't know until you're right with it, okay? So write with it. If you think there's something wrong, look at it under the loop. And the first step is always tying alignment, not smooth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do not touch your nib to anything abrasive until you are sure that your tines are aligned. Because okay. you, so you can create some problems that way. And so are there, are there any questions, Dan, that we need to cover about alignment before? I think we're going to move on to a little smoothing now. Correct. Uh, there was one by Tim. He just asked, um, do the tines ever sort of go back to where they were pre-adjustment? Um, and in my experience, when, when you adjust a nib and it's set in the right spot, it, it tends to stay. Um, I don't know, Brian, have you ever experienced any differences where, with a, a nib going back to a misaligned state after you've adjusted it? Uh, there are some situations where that can recur. I don't want to get too far into this, but it can have a lot to do. Like, let's say that my two fingers are the, are the tines, right? And let's say that these tines have lots of pressure pushing them together. 
right? And they're, 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 I mean, obviously you, you really don't know it, but let's say that there's this pressure pushing them together, and then, you know, when you bring it out of alignment, they might even click and one go in front of the other, if that makes any sense. Sometimes when these tines have inordinate pressure against each other, when you align, sometimes they want to come back to right where they were. The bottom line is, let's say that your tines look like this, okay? What you want to do is hyperextend it a little bit when, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I should have lowered the time. Sorry, I went the wrong way. Let's say that your tines look like this. What I'm going to do is hyperextend it a little bit beyond where it should go, and then it'll bounce back to where it should be. You're not going to be able to just take a nib and just move it to this position, and then it's going to find its spot right there. You need to go a little bit past the point of where it wants to be, and then when it springs back into, into its position, it'll come right back to where it should be. And that's one of the reasons why when you do time alignment, sometimes it takes maybe three or four tries. You know, you, you, you lower one, it's close. Uh, I'm going to lower a little more, it's close. Raise that one, got it. Okay, that's just about right, perfect. You know, you, you're rarely will you get it with the first try. It might take a couple of figuring out how much hyperextension you need to do to get to where it is. And you'll also notice that 18 carat nibs or 14 carat nibs or gold nibs in general, they might require a little bit more hyperextension than a steel nib because it's a softer material, you know? Good? All right. All right. Let's move on to smoothing papers or lapping film and micro mesh. There's two things that I use. Um, this, now, I, I call it mylar paper, but I think that the technical term really is like a lapping film. Uh, the green one is 1.0 micron the white one is 0.3 micron. Now, what does this mean? A lot of people that don't know much about abrasives have no idea what a micron is, and I never knew anyways. Bottom line is that the green stuff is a little bit more abrasive than the white stuff, okay? So this is kind of like for um, more extreme smoothing issues where you want to work a little bit more aggressive on the way to the white, okay? And then uh, an important point about this mylar paper, I I'm sorry, lapping film, is that you'll notice there's a side that's shiny, and you'll see that there's a side that's not shiny. You want to use the non-shiny side. This stuff is so, what's the word that I want? This stuff is so non-abrasive. It's such a mild, mild abrasive that sometimes you can't even tell the difference by feeling whether or not you're actually working on the abrasive side. You know, it's, it's that mild. So, if you want, take the shiny side and put a big Sharpie X on it so that you know not to smooth with that side of the paper. And the same thing with the green stuff. So that is what I call mylar paper, but I think it's technically correct to call it lapping film. Now the other stuff that we have, if you got the kit from Richard Bender, then you got a buffing stick like this. Okay? And the there's three grits on here. The pink is 2400. Now, don't get confused either because 2400 micro mesh is not the same as 2400 silicone carbide, wet dry, or aluminum oxide sandpaper. So, don't think that 2400 here is the exact same thing as 2400 sandpaper. It's a different, completely different scale. When it comes to smoothing, you don't want to use sandpaper. I mean, even, I mean, sure, you could probably use like a 2000 or even a higher grit, but these are much better. Just uh, sandpaper is for shaping and grinding. You don't want to use sandpaper for this. I, I'm sorry, I got off on a little bit of a tangent on sandpaper, but back to these buffing sticks. So 2400 grit is the pink, 4000 grit is the white, and then 12,000 grit is the gray on the back. Okay, now the, the 2400, I'm going to use that if I've got a real non-smooth nib. If the tines are aligned and I've still got a smoothing problem that's really significant, I'll go to this. But good nibs coming from good manufacturers usually won't need this for the smoothing portion. Usually I don't even really need the, the white part of the, of the micro mesh. A lot of times I'll just go straight to the 12,000 grit. Now my micro mesh that I use comes in a slightly larger... Um, sheet like this and then there's my mylar paper uh, but I'll use I'll use Richards since that's what most of the participants in this in this um, thing have now I'm gonna tell you one downside to micro mesh that I personally don't like micro mesh is rubbery okay now what does that mean and why is that really a, uh, why could that be a problem um, micro mesh being rubbery if you're using a sharp nib 
like a like a crisp italic or a cursive italic where the corners haven't been knocked off or maybe the you want the corners on there like a crisp italic or an extra fine a double extra fine a needlepoint nib I don't like using those nibs I'll go to camera two here on micro mesh and the re I'll just grab my sheet here the reason that I don't like this with a sharp nib is that if you push forward with it it's very easy for this rubbery material to grab whatever sharp on that nib and it might dig in and then if you're doing that fast then the next thing you know your nib will literally like if you pretend that my hand is the micro mesh and my nib or my fingers it'll dig in and then it'll kind of flick out and you might just totally ruin your tine alignment by using micro mesh because the rubbery surface caught the nib and then it you know popped back out so micro mesh is perfectly fine no problem at least my opinion with like you know big nibs stubs italics uh, that are that are smooth um, broads mediums fines but I don't, don't like micro mesh for extra fine and smaller or italics that have you know like a like a crisper edge to them it's easy to catch the nib on here and possibly misalign your tines so for that reason, I usually use mylar paper or lapping film more than what I do micro mesh. But there's nothing wrong with using micro mesh in, in, in these situations. Um, so when I go to smooth, I will use one of the two, um, and I recommend that you experiment with these as well. You're not going to you're not going to create any major harm if you take the pink micro mesh and start doing some figure eights on it. You know, after you do this, you'll probably notice that there's some tooth to the nib. Because very simply, it's it's a it's a it's a fairly harsh abrasive compared to the super fine sides of it. Okay, so pick whichever you want to use, micro mesh or mylar paper. It doesn't really matter which. And if you have a more stubborn nib, then what you're going to do? This is the actual smoothing process. I'm going to use the the mylar paper or the lapping film. I'm going to do some figure eights in your normal handwriting. You know, in your normal hand position. And then you're going to move over to the side. You're going to rotate the pen to this side. You're going to rotate the pen to the other side. So you do some figure eights and rotate it to the side, go over to the other side. Then you're going to do a higher angle with figure eights. Then you're going to do a lower angle with figure eights and kind of bring that up. And already you should probably be able to tell a difference, and that does feel better. Now that's not the last step for me though. I like to go straight to point three micron paper, which is the white stuff. And you're going to do the exact same thing. Do figure eights in your normal hand position. Go to the side, do some figure eights. Go to the other side, do some figure eights. And then go high and low. But one thing I want to stress, it's not, a, it's not important to do this and then that position and that position and that. You want to, you want to transition through all those positions smoothly. You know, you don't want to, you, we are using an abrasive. So you don't want to create like five spots of flatness on the nib. You want to make your strokes even and keep your movements fluid so that you're creating a circular abrasion, if you will. And after you've done that, check it once again. Very good. This nib is really smooth. Here's the final step that I like to do, and this is my personal preference. On the 0.3 micron, I will hold the, the, the nib exactly. You know, I showed you earlier how I went to a high angle, went to a low angle. I will hold the nib exactly in my hand position and I will do some figure eights and I'm going to make my pressure lighter and lighter and slower and slower until I'm barely, barely even touching the paper. And when you do that, what you're doing is you're making the abrasive action even lighter. You're making it a little bit more polished. And I notice that when I do that, then all of a sudden I go from nice and smooth to nice and buttery smooth. That extra step of going very, very lightly and also maybe even a little bit slowly at the end, holding it in exactly your hand position can make a, a, not a big difference, but that little, you know, uh, what's, the, what's the joke from Spinal Tap? If this one goes to 10, but this one goes to 11. Sorry, that's my, my little <laughs> Ni Nigel quote. Did anybody get that? Is it just me? Just you. Yeah, thank you. So really... <laughs> That's it when it comes to smoothing. Now, why, why, are you why, using why are we making eights, Brian? Figure eights because you are basically exposing the nib to, you know, all directions, all writing directions. You It'll round do... all the corners on the inside and outside of the tines. Yeah. Okay, uh, my nib is perfectly butter smooth. We can finish now. I guess we're I'll done. Go home. Yeah, we're Turn done. off. <laughs> all right, we're finished. So, again, I, I did that on Mylar paper. If you're doing the same thing on micro mesh, 
then you're just going to start, if you need to, start with the white. And again, experiment with these. See what the pink does for you. Test it. See what the white does for you. And then see what, you know, so if I were doing this, I would do some figure eights like this. I would move around. I would go a little low, go a little high, rotating and moving it the whole time. Then over to the micro mesh, same thing. Now, I feel, my personal opinion, and someone could contradict me on this, and maybe, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I feel that the 0.3 micron paper is lightly, more, lightly less abrasive than the 12,000 micro mesh. So after I use 12,000 micro mesh, I will usually still go to the 0.3 micron paper and do the very light touch thing, you know, and do, do the very, very light touch, then back over here, and again, I'm back to perfectly smooth. So really, if I think if I've covered everything, that's the procedure for tine alignment and smoothing nibs. Let me check my notes and make sure that I didn't um, uh, forget about anything. Um, if that's it, then we can, the, the, the flossing topic is really quick and also really easy too. So if that's it for smoothing, then I think that uh, tine alignment and smoothing, then let's cover flossing real fast. Um, the only time you should worry about flossing is if you take a look through your loop and it looks like there's debris in between the nib. Okay, people that use cheap paper, fibrous paper, a lot of times that can create a problem because when you're writing along with an inexpensive paper that's fibrous, then you can actually pick up the fibers of the paper into your nib. Next thing you know, your, your flow is kind of a mess. You know, the, 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 the pen's not flowing really well, the ink isn't flowing really well, and I don't know why because I don't have magnification to look at it and see what's going on. So let's say that you take a look and it's like, whoa, it looks like there's some stuff in between my tines. You can take this brass, I'm going to camera two. You can take this brass shim and all that you're going to do is work the brass shim in between the nib and pull it through. And then you'll, if there is debris on there, you'll notice that it, that it probably came off with that brass shim. The brass shim comes from Richard make sure that you have a brass shim that's very, very, very thin. If you can't find this anywhere, buy it from Richard because this is what I know is the right thickness. It's, it's like leaf thin. It's very thin. The other Maybe option... It's, uh, it's, it's a good... I, I can just jump in there. It's, it's yeah. I think, two thousandth of an inch uh, yes. in thickness. Correct. And you can get it... I know that, at least as far as I know, because I know, I know that Richard been the one to recommend this to someone, uh, there's... K and S, so the letter K and then ampersand S, K and S railroading supplies, and uh, they make this stuff. Two thousand of inch. You can get bigger sheets. You can cut them yourself if you want. If you you know if you want to get it somewhere else or, or what you yep. want, you need more of the stuff. That's maybe an option for people. You can also get it at a place called McMaster Car, which uh, specializes in a lot. But the thing with McMaster Car, I don't know that you're going to buy just two sheets. And you don't need a sheet this big. You only need this little piece here, okay? Now, the other option for flossing, if you can't find this, this brass shim, or the other reason I bring this up is that anybody that has a mechanic father or anyone, a mechanic friend or anyone that works on cars, you can use what's called a feeler gauge. Um, uh, mechanics will use this to gap their spark plugs. In other words, you know, you'll put a, a gauge in there and then set the proper gap for your spark plug. Well, no mechanic ever uses their thinnest one. I think that this one here is 0 0.02 millimeter, which is very, very thin. No mechanic is going to gap their spark plug to be this thin, as far as I know. I'm not a master mechanic by any means, but I've, I've never needed these things. So if you have a friend's mechanic, you can probably ask them, hey, can I just get your thinnest feeler gauge? And they're going, yeah, I never use it anyways. Same deal. You just take this through here, um, right through the center of the tines, and then just kind of pull it through, and then you'll get that debris out of there. So that's flossing the tines. It's not, it's not that difficult. It's actually very easy. I think that every fountain pen owner out there should have a brass shim or a feeler gauge to do this. I can't tell you how many times someone has sent a pen back to me and said, the flow just stopped. Something's wrong. And then it's almost embarrassingly easy that, you know, it comes to me. I open up the package. I read their stuff. Okay, that's the problem. I'll take a look. Whoosh, done. Ship it right back, you know, and everybody can do this at home. So that, that, I think that's critical, you know, if you're a fountain pen owner and you want to really enjoy the hobby to the 
<clears throat> as much as you can. These techniques, flossing, I think it's critical, and I, I want to encourage everybody to you know tinker with their pens and, and tweak um, their pens. So really, I think that's it as far as the overall presentation. If there's any questions, let me know. If I didn't cover anything completely, you know, of course we can do that. Uh, if there's nothing from our little group here, uh, it might be time to bring some people in and let's fix some nibs. We do have a few questions. Okay. Um, Nick asked, um, what about smoothing stub nibs? Um, would the technique be the same? And I, I would caution first, if, if a stub nib is a little scratchy or isn't smooth, definitely check that tie-in alignment first. Yep. Uh, always start there, like Brian has said, and then if it does need smoothing for some reason, um, I typically don't tend to do that figure eight um, when smoothing a stub. I, I keep the nib flat, and I, I start at an angle low, and as I pull the pen back, I raise it up to get that nice curve on the nib. Yeah. The other thing about stubs that we can leave for another day, but I'll touch on it, is that let's say instead of your tines being like this, let's say that your tines are like that. Well, I've got to get my thumbs out of the way because it's a stub. Of course, do the alignment just like Eric said, but a lot of times... I think Dan said uh, that, actually. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I've, I've juxtaposed your names too often. I'm sorry. Um, so a lot of times a stub being a little scratchy is probably the corners here on either corner, okay? So a lot of times with a stub, what I will do is I'll take one of these mild abrasives and kind of lean on the corner a little bit and then and then rotate it in so that it, it, it hits the corner and then transitions to the flat part of the nib. Do the, do, do the same thing to the other corner. You know, rub it into the corner and then transition over to the flat side of the nib and then start smoothing because a lot of times, like I said, stubs, cursed of metallics, if there's a major smoothing problem, Problem. A lot of times it's the corner. Now, of course, it depends on how the nibmeister or the factory ground it, but a lot of times that's the issue that I run into. And again, not to get too far into stubs. That's for another day. And then uh, Tim asks, does it matter if the pin is inked or not to use the buff stick or micro mesh? Yes, you want to have your pen inked because the ink will give you a, you know, a lubricant. Um, now, you could probably do it without, but why would you evaluate your nib directly? dry when you really can't. I mean, how, how can you really evaluate how your nib is, is writing if there's not ink in it? So yeah, you, you should always have your pen inked up when you're doing this procedure. We have a guest with us. I think yes. I, I saw the name Michael. Michael, are you with us? Uh, if you're talking, Michael, we can't hear you. you. You might need to hit the microphone icon. If it's If it's red, click it. We see you. Just show us your pen. We'll solve the problem. <laughs> no, can't hear you yet. Uh, Michael, if, if your microphone icon is red, click it, because I think you've got your microphone muted. We'll let you know when we hear you. My microphone icon is like in the top right corner of of the Google oh, Hangout window. The Google Hangout, yes. I hear new noise. Is that you, Michael? I think one of my neighbors dropped something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm oh, with you. There, there we go. Are. Yeah, there you yeah. Go. Michael. Right. Michael, how I'm, are I'm you? A, uh, I'm a Google Hangout newbie, obviously. That's all right. <laughs> Well, and, you've uh, covered you've covered uh, a lot of things. Uh, that Michael, I, to I have about. to cut you off, Michael. Where where are you calling from? I'm sorry, uh, Michael in Alaska. In Alaska. Oh, right. All right. Okay. Hello. Please continue. Oh, see, I cut him off, and now he's what? He's gone. He's frozen. There you no, are. You know what? I've got I've got a second uh, iteration of this session working, and it's giving me a lot of confusion. So stand by one. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. No problem. We'll stand by. They have fountain pens in Alaska. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I shipped a few there. No. Cool. Doesn't the ink like freeze? <laughs> All right. It was it was here. worse than the movie Inception. Uh, having two sessions of you guys working at once. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, the the stub question was mine. Thanks very much for covering that. With regard to cross tines, if the tips are actually crossed, not uh, uh, vertically but laterally, I've I've got one pin like that, and I don't. It looks because I'm opposing. 
the wings of the nib, it looks rather daunting, and I don't even know what tools to use. And, and so let's say that let's say that my fingers are your tines, right? Right. Are they are they folded over like this? Yes. Okay. The, the the what's most likely happening is you've got undue pressure. The nib is actually putting pressure on those tines, and and they're they're pushing against each other. The best thing. That, do you know if this is a gold nib or a steel nib? It's a plated steel. Okay. I, I, I really think that the best thing to do is to probably just bring them, you know, bring them back into alignment. You know, make your finger, you know, uh, basically use your fingers to bring these back to where they're they're together, and then see how that works. Now, if this is under undue pressure, then it's possible that when you start writing again, that they click back to where they were. And have Have you tried that before? Have you tried to bring them back into alignment, and what happens? It will. Uh, in effect, it creates a a gap, a, a uh, ellipse shaped gap. When the when the point of the nib is aligned, then it creates this seed shaped gap down the slit. Okay. Right. So so when so when you put them back together, do you have this or do you have this? Well, down at the nib itself, it's 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 quite fine and it works. Uh, however. Tip. The capillary action is compromised in the slit because when they are aligned at the tip, the slit is then expanded uh, right. toward the, the rear of the pin. Brian, what he's describing yeah. is if you take the slit from the breather hole to the tip, it's, yeah. it, it's bowing out. That's I understand. It. The, the yeah, that's not uniform. That's, that, that's not something for us to cover today. Um, my advice on that one right now is, is is to call a pro and get it taken care of. Okay. I mean, if I really if I really got into this right now, then we'd be here for another half hour. And I, I like I said, we want to keep the topics of this to be just basic time alignment and smoothing. Understood. So, um, yeah. I'll, I, um, if you if you could entertain one more question, then I'll get out of the way for the next uh, interested party. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, I like what this product is doing for me, the Simichrome for. Uh, mm -hmm many of my pens, both the bodies and the nibs. I'd like to know comments about, is it safe for nibs? Uh, what's required to rinse it off to, to let the ink work properly uh, for capillary purposes? And then I'll, I'll see you guys later. Yeah, I'm perfectly good with that product as long as you're removing the nib from the feed and the housing. What you don't want to do is get that stuck in your, in your ink channel. So don't, don't take that Simichrome polish and polish the you know, if I've got my pen right here and I start polishing my nib when it's still on the pen, I'm going to drive all that polish down inside the feed, down inside the channel, and I guarantee you're going to make a real problem. So right. if, you know, if you pull the nib and the feed out, you separate the nib from the feed, you put the feed in the sink and scrub it and, you know, clean it up and use it a toothbrush, and then add a little polish if you've got something um, stubborn, that's okay. But then you have to be darn sure that all that Simichrome polish is gone when you reinstall the nib. Uh, flossing the tine would be critical in that situation because I guarantee you're going to get some Simichrome down inside the, the nib slit. So, you know, I don't even know if it's water soluble. I, 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 you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't really know the chemistry that much about um, Simichrome. Here's my, my advice. It, remove the nib from the feed. Clean it up as best as you can with a toothbrush, you know, like a mild toothbrush underwater. Use a paper towel and then take a look if it really does need some kind of ridiculous polishing. I guess that what I'm saying is if you can achieve the same results just with a paper towel or a mild uh, towel, then avoid the Simichrome just in case on a nib. Very good. I, okay. There's a product that... that I just it occurred to me. I think I can't remember what this is called. Some kind of super eraser, Mr. Clean product that's meant for household use. Oh, the ma uh, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Magic Eraser. This yeah. did a wonderful job of removing ink from a plastic barrel. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, I, I saw an article recently on on that Mr. Clean, and I always thought there was some crazy chemical in there, but my understanding is what that is. It's a new type of micro abrasive yes. that actually does an amazing job. It's uh, fantastic. I, yeah, my, my seven-year-old did Sharpie all over his uh, all over his bedroom wall. No, when, he did not. When, when he was two or three, oh. relax. He didn't know any better. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> <I got my laughs> arms. 
And I was amazed. That Sharpie came off the wall perfectly fine. So, yeah, I, I don't have any problem with those magic erasers. But remember, it is an abrasive. It, it is an abrasive. So if you're going to polish a barrel with that, eh, you might want to try it on a rather inconspicuous place first. I don't know that I would recommend using that before I would use some kind of acrylic polish first because okay. that might, you know, that, that might be a little bit harsh compared well, to what a softer... Well, if you're for the antique effect, it's, it's instant brassing. <laughs> there you go. Instant yeah. brassing. I, I think that, that I, I'm not saying that's a bad option, but I would, when you're polishing a barrel, you always start with a mild abrasive, the mildest abrasive you have, and then see how harsh your abrasive has to get to, you know, to actually get the job done. Well, I want to thank you guys. Appreciate uh, you doing the show. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye. I need to find out how to go, go away now. <laughs> this is, this is a, a hang up top right corner. You can stick around. There's plenty of room still. Mr. Okay. Smith, any questions from the, from the chat? No, I think we're good so far. Uh, Maya had a question. I just missed it. Maya, oh, there's Maya. Does, uh, what about making sure the feed is centered properly? That can throw an aligned nib out of alignment when the pen is used. Well, if, if we're talking about flow, but she says that a, a, a feed that is not properly centered can throw the alignment out? Uh, I, I, I don't think that a misaligned feed will really do much for tying alignment unless it's really, really a mess. Um, we didn't cover a lot with feed alignment right now today because it's usually not a huge critical issue. And for those that don't know, what we're talking about is making sure that the feed goes straight up the, the center of the nib. Um, you know, it's important that that breather, I'm sorry, the breather, it's important that that ink channel on top does, you know, find, the ink has to find its way to the tip. But generally, if you're off by a tiny bit, generally, you know, that's not going to make a huge deal. So the bottom line with this is that feed alignment is not a, in my opinion, a super, super critical aspect to what we discussed today, all right? That's more of an issue for flow and some other issues. The bottom line, if you see that your feet is off, then just bump it. Just move bump it. it and, yeah, bump it over until you see this, this down the center. Mm -hmm. If you really want to get picky, what you can also do... I want to do, get picky, Brian. What do I do? All right. If you really want to get picky, you will notice, and I've got to, I don't know that my camera will focus on this, the breather, the hole in the center of the nib, right there, the hole, okay? Uh, these pens from Richard don't have breather holes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, mo a lot of pens do. For, for pens that do have that hole oh, in the middle, right there on the nib, you can take your magnification and take a look and see if your breather, ch if your breather channel is going right down that hole. Now, again, this is one of those situations where you could create an issue that you don't think uh, uh, exists, or I'm sorry, that you think exists but really does not, is what I mean. I have had emails from clients that they say, Brian, I got my Edison pen, and you know what? The feed channel is not going down the center of the, bre of, of the breather hole in, in the nib. And I'm going, again, did you write with it? No, I didn't. You got to write with it, you know? So that's another one where it's not critical. If you want to be picky and you want to get that right down the middle, all you got to do is move it with your finger. Just, just so everyone knows, every example that Brian has given about a customer who's contacted him with a question like this has been me. Thank it's you. It's always been Eric. It's always been Eric. <laughs> I was trying to leave your name out of this. Uh, we have a new person in the chat. I think I saw the name John. Hi, John. Silent John. I'm here. Hi, Brian. Oh, hello, John. Hi. John, uh, uh, where are you calling from, John? I am calling from South Florida. South Florida. Ooh. South Florida would be Key West. Uh, not that far south. Okay. Ten <laughs> times, just uh, oh. between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Okay. What have you got for us, John? Well, my question is: I've got this um, Schaefer Royal Selangor with uh, extra fine, very much an extra fine nib, mm -hmm. and there isn't a whole lot of tipping left. There's a small amount of tipping on there. I can't really get it to be smooth, and I would like it to be smooth, and I've tried these techniques. It's improved it, but on the side strokes especially, it feels rough. What can I do about just smoothing those uh, side strokes? 
I'm sorry, did you say fine or extra fine? Extra fine, maybe extra extra fine. Extra fine with very little tipping left, Mr. Gray. Yeah, you know, Dr. I mean, one, one, one thing that we need to put into perspective, especially since we're addressing this towards um, laymen, beginners, people that have not worked with nibs previously. I'm, 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 I'm going to make that assumption for everybody, and if I'm insulting someone, I, you know, that's not my intention. I'm just going to make that assumption so that we play, we take the safe route, okay? Um, at this point, if you're going to work on an extra fine, a double extra fine, a, a needle point, a really, really tiny nib, please understand that an extra fine nib, uh, having the expectation that that nib is going to be as buttery smooth as a broad or as a medium that's well tuned is sometimes unrealistic. Okay? Now, of course, when we talk about Mike Masuyama, we talk about Richard Bender, we talk about these guys that do this, you know, and, and they, they can take an extra fine and they can make it to be buttery smooth in many cases. But even, you know, even Mike Masuyama's needlepoint nibs are not going to be generally you know, like buttery, buttery smooth, the same way that like a big fat broad will. It's 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 like asking a needle to not poke you. You know, it's just a very, very fine nib. So I, I hate to not give you a definitive answer, but I think that when it comes to applying these techniques to like extra fines, double extra fines, and finer, it's probably a good idea to leave that to the pros. Um, I can guess what might be going on with your nib, but I don't want to speculate without seeing it live. You know, really, what we're addressing this today, and I guess I should have put that caveat out there, that, you know, really, really small nibs, um, these techniques will work, but if you don't get perfect results, you probably shouldn't have the expectation of ha having a buttery smooth nib anyways. You know, factory ground extra fines usually are not buttery smooth the way to do that is to really take it to someone that's skilled and quite honestly my skills with extra fines and double extra fines and grinding them myself they aren't what I wish they were um, you know, I, Richard Bender has offered to help me out and someday I'll probably make a trip and learn a little bit more but I think the easiest answer is if your extra fine or smaller has a little bit of tooth you try these techniques but if it doesn't work live with it for now because and then and maybe bring it to a pen show or send it to a nib meister and have that done because that's when you're getting into a very very difficult range of nib tuning and not something that we're going to cover for the layman at least today for sure by the way when uh, a nib is factory polished at the end mm -hmm. what type of grit do you think they use to give uh, on, on their on their nibs what kind of abrasives or what kind of grit how fine do they go when they give the final I, you know what, honestly, I don't know. It's probably like, um, it, it's probably in, in the range of this 0.3 micron, this 12,000 micro mesh. You know, like when I do grinds, I don't have my grinding equipment with me, but when I have my grinding equipment, I use a jeweler's wheel that's a green. Uh, they're coated by colors. Um, there's like white and blue and green, and the finest is green. I'm pretty sure that's what they what what they would use in most cases. But again, I can't speak for Yovo, Bach, Mont Blanc, Aurora, all these people that manufacture all their nibs. You know, they might all use a different thing. I I really can't comment on that. I, I wouldn't know. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Say hello to Florida for us. Hey, Florida. Send some weather up here to Ohio. <laughs> Thank you, John. Aziza, you have been very quiet throughout the show. I've been observing my nibs. Observing your nibs. So uh, mm -hmm. you have at least 110 nibs to observe. How far have you gotten? I have made it through three. Three? Now, do you have, have you, any, do you, have have you made questions? them better? Um, well, one of them is a gold nib that I'm very hesitant. Well, yeah, don't start with that, Aziza. Yeah, don't, don't start That's with that. That's the first thing he told us. I know. <laughs> but I was like, well... If I'm really gentle, but I didn't do anything to it. But most of my nibs are pretty decent so far. Well, take one of your Lamy Safaris and misalign it so you have something to play with. <laughs> misalign it. Yeah, I know I should Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. That's what he told me to do. I yeah. have a gifted uh, Sailor Clear Candy here, which I'm now going to have a peek at. Don't forget, one of the nice things about, like, specifically Lamy Safaris, if you wanted to use those to experiment with, 
is that you can buy replacement nibs for pretty cheap. I don't. I think they're less than twenty bucks, aren't they? I think they're so fifteen, they, and they 15? just fifteen. Yeah. So so if you yeah. if you make a major mistake on a Lamy Safari, that I mean that or these little cheapos that we got from Richard, that's perfect to start experimenting with. You know, maybe you know if you have a Lamy Safari, maybe buy like three extra nibs and use them to do these techniques and to practice until you feel better about doing it on a more expensive pen or a gold nibbed pen. Well, that's interesting. You now that we're talking about Lamy Safari, those nibs just you know pull right out of the pen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would there ever be a reason to? pull the nib out to align the tines because we did all the pushing and the pulling with the nib and the feed in the pen. Um, yeah, there is, but we won't cover it today. I mean, that's when you get into some severe no, issues. No, that, you're that's, no fun, Mr. Gray. Thank I know. That's <laughs> like if, you, if you've got a severe baby's bottom going on or if you've got this reverse okay. splay all going right. on, that's when you might need to take it off, but we won't get into that but, today. But for this aligning up and down, there's really no reason to pull the nib. No, not, not at this point. If you want to, you can, but here's the problem, though. When you do pull the nib, if you jam it on there incorrectly, you could misalign the tine when you're, when you're doing the installation again, you know? Not a big deal. You can always fix it that way, but, uh, you know, the, sometimes with nibs that are stubborn to get into the feed, if I'm doing an installation and I need to push pretty hard, then sometimes I'm misaligning the tines just by doing that. So, you know, it's going to defeat the purpose if you take off your Lamy nib and you fix the tines, and then you mess them up when you're putting it back on again. You know what I mean? Now, the likelihood of that happening is low, but it's... it's hey, we're talking about Aziza here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. One uh, thing I think that also right. makes it useful to, to um, uh, uh, keep the nib on there is that you can keep it inked, and you can just try it out, do some extra alignment, try it out again. Yeah. It's a lot more difficult when you just have yeah. a, a spare nib in your hand. You're not going to be able to test the nib if you're holding it in your fingers, you know. You, you can. But, well, sure. <laughs> I don't know what kind of ink supply you'll have. Don't try and write a paragraph. That's hilarious. Have we lost Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith has taken off. Now he's smoothing some nibs. Yeah. Oh, he's <laughs> back. I'm just wondering if we have questions in the, in the chat room. The chat looks pretty good. Um, oh, wait, there was... Here comes Mr. Oh, Smith. Oh, here he is. He's back. Dun, 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 dun. Yes, Mr. Smith, we are waiting for you. <laughs> Any questions from the chat room, Dan? Why are you waiting for me? Oh, we're looking for chat room <laughs> questions. You were in charge of them. Oh, that's fine. No, there's no questions. No questions. I've sent out all invitations. And I did, okay. that, I did that before we even said we were going to. So if there's no more questions, this show's over. Well, that's John fine. has another question. John has another question. All right. I wanted to know what to do about pens that that are hard starters. Um, the first thing that I would do is floss the tines, the same thing that we just demonstrated. Mm -hmm. um, if that doesn't take care of it, then we're going to get into more complex issues than what we want to cover today. If it's a hard starter, almost all the time. I mean, I'll, I'll cover it, but I may not get into... Uh, I'll, I'll cover the diagnosis, but I won't cover the treatment. How's that? Okay? Um, couple. I mean, there's... Basically, what you're doing is something is wrong with capillary action. It's not delivering the ink all the way to the tip, all the way to the paper. If you flossed it and you've removed any debris, if you need to floss even more, then you can remove the nib from the feed completely and then get way down into the slit, all the way down. Um, from there on out, you could have a feed to nib mating problem. You could have a feed problem of some type. You could have a case of baby's bottom where if the nib is separated like this severely, you know, if it's got a wide gap, then what happens is the ink let, let's, you know, the, the, the ink will probably be right up here to like my second knuckle, but it won't reach all the way down to the page. Does that make sense? It's kind of difficult to explain this just using my hands. But if, if, if the nib is doing this, then the ink will want to draw up inside that channel, and it's not being delivered all the way down to the paper. That could be it. You could also have a problem where you're doing this, and then when you, uh, if you have this reverse uh, splay going on, 
then when you touch the, the when you touch the nib to the paper and the tines spread a little bit, that will bring the ink straight back instead of forward. So there, there's a lot of things that could be causing that, and it may not be a topic for today. Um, the end. The end. I th yeah, I'm sorry. I kind of ended that abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> that, so the, that, that leads me into my next question. Uh, I think this went really well. Thank you, Brian. Yes. Uh, and we stuck, I believe, we stuck to the topics, the specific area of this that you wanted to, which was basic time alignment, up and down, and some yep. smoothing. What would, off the top of your head, be the next seminar? Where would you go from here? Probably dealing with, with this. You know, when you've got, like, in other words, like if you take a look at my notes, you'll see that I think that like a little, little tiny gap is perfect, and that's what I shoot for. Maybe we could talk about that. Maybe we could talk about increasing flow. Decreasing flow is a little more difficult. I might not want to cover that immediately. Uh, increasing flow is something that we could talk about pretty easily. Dealing with a little bit more complex uh, tine splays would be something that we could deal with as well. Um, let's discuss it though. I'm, 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 you know, I, I haven't thought about it yet because obviously I just had blinders on for this presentation right now. But you know, uh, whenever we want to do another one of these, let me know and let's figure out what a good topic would be. And we can right. also get feedback from people that are watching. What topic would you like to be covered? Obviously, we can't get into stuff like. Uh, I mean, I don't know. We could do stub grinds possibly as long as you know people have the right equipment. Maybe it would be more of a demonstration as to how to do it, not necessarily like try this at home. But, yeah, but that can, I, don't think, we... I don't think that would be the next one, though. No, 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 no. But what I'm like saying is... Flow yeah. adjustment, that's, yeah. that seems logical to me to yeah. go from, from this point. Because now everybody's going to be practicing what you taught us today. Yeah. And so later on, we need something else. And I, I like the flow adjustment. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, anything in chat? Um, no. Aziza, do you have any questions? No, no, I'm good. Doc Brown, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> how was how was your day? Almost over, uh, really, isn't it? Pr pretty good. Yeah, I, I have one question. What what is the meaning of life? Oh, the no, it's ben. the number forty. No, the number forty-two. Oh, oh. all right. Anybody get the no one? That's no. from a movie. Yes. It's the movie. I, I, I thought he was going to say a number four nib. It was the. <laughs> It was actually a book before it was a movie, The Hitchhiker's oh. Guide to the Galaxy. Oh. Okay, then I'm calling yeah. it a day, and I thank everybody for being here. Yeah, well, thank you guys. Honestly, I hope, like I said, the whole idea is to make sure that there's got to be a lot of people out there who are a little bit disappointed with the nib here and there. And the whole idea is to teach people how they can hopefully breathe some new life into some of their pens that maybe are disappointing them because these techniques are really easy and the more that you can learn to do this at home the the more you're going to enjoy the hobby cool all right goodbye everybody awesome. hey thanks everybody i really appreciate it thank Bye -bye. you asegúrate de dejarnos tus comentarios Dinos lo que te gusta y lo que no. Y eso es todo. Espero hayan encontrado esto de ayuda y nos vemos después. Bye bye.